All right. So this course is about communicating about data. And I think before we start talking about communicating about data, it's good to get on the same page about what data actually is. And just as a linguistic note, I usually say data is rather than data are, but people have uh, different opinions and I'd be happy to talk about why my philosophy is such that I uh, say data is in that kind of uh, singular. So data is a set of variables that capture information about aspects of the world. And variables are called variables because they vary. Uh, they are not always the same. So you could think about temperature. Temperature could be a variable because temperature is not always the same. Um, data contains variables. It also contains observations. And observations are times when we've been able to look at those variables. So in this course, we're mostly going to be considering tidy data. So this is an idea from Hadley Wickham, and we'll bring it back in when we're talking about R, but it works in any type of data analysis software. Essentially, tidy data is tidy if every variable has its own column. So sometimes untidy data, you get two things stuck together in the same column, and, and then variables aren't separate. Uh, tidy data also requires that every case or observation is its own row uh, and every value is in its own cell so that things don't get smushed together. I usually stick on a sort of fourth rule, which is that each case is the same sort of thing. So one type of untidy data that I encounter a lot has to do with education. So you'll get a spreadsheet of education data from say the state of Minnesota, and it will have uh, observations or cases. Some of them are schools, some of them are school districts. Uh, then there's maybe a row that's the whole state. And those cases or observations, they're not the same kind of thing. You can't compare them apples to apples. So I usually add that on to the rules for tidy data. Of course, there's other ways to format and represent data. If you're a computer scientist, you probably know about many of these structures. Um, so another method would be a hierarchical or list-based structure. You could think about XML or JSON. Um, and I've kind of tried to visualize what that might look like. So these kind of nests that hold together uh, similar um, pieces of information. We're not going to focus on that very much in this course, although uh, if that's something that you want to work on for your final project, I'm happy to help you conceptualize how maybe you could move from this hierarchical data structure to something that's more tidy. The tools that we're going to use in this course work best with tidy data. Sometimes tools uh, work better with hierarchical data, but you're probably going to need to move toward tidy data. And then, of course, when we have variables, we often make the distinction between a numeric variable and a categorical variable. Um, and so sometimes we call these quantitative and qualitative. I usually say numeric, uh, I don't usually put that numerical, numeric and categorical. Um, and if you want to be more specific, you could break down your numeric variables into things that are discrete, like integers and continuous uh, numbers that have decimals, maybe. Uh, categorical variables, we don't have really a word or a term for the kind of normal categorical variables. So that one might be eye color as an example. And your eye color could be blue or green or brown. There's probably other eye colors, but those are categories. They're separate categories, but they don't have any ordering to them. So that's kind of a normal categorical variable. We're also going to talk about ordinal categorical variables, and that would be something like class year. So you're a first year, and then you're a sophomore, and then you're a junior, and finally you're a senior. Again, maybe there's more categories if you want to get more detailed, but there is a natural ordering to that variable. So like I said, I don't have a term for what a normal categorical variable is. It's just a categorical variable, but we can be more specific and say an ordinal categorical variable. Um, and when we have synchronous time together, we'll maybe brainstorm some variables that uh, could be collected about you or about a person that are both numeric and categorical. So one of my points that I like to make in this course is that data can seem neutral, but it's always generated by humans. 
Um, and I usually do a privilege alert here. So I am white, I'm straight, I'm cisgender, I'm middle class, I'm very highly educated, I have a PhD, I'm American, um, I'm a lady, that's maybe my only avenue where I don't have massive, massive privilege. So um, I'm always doing the best that I can when I talk about issues like race and class and gender and all this other stuff. But you can always feel free to call me out about something if I'm uh, being inappropriate. So you could call me out publicly, put your hand up in class, leave me a comment on this video, or you could send me some kind of anonymous note um, or, or talk to me uh, in private. So uh, I just think that it's important to acknowledge where we're coming from when we start talking about these sorts of things. Um, and especially because sometimes data gets collected intentionally. So if you think about the census, every 10 years we do this massive undertaking to collect a ton of data in the United States. There's other places that collect data. So Pew Research does surveys about opinions of Americans for the most part. So they'll ask things about, you know, how people view different generations or how uh, much technology has been adopted, um, different political opinions. So they run a bunch of large-scale telephone surveys for the most part. Uh, of course, science collects data very intentionally. Uh, if you're working in a biology lab or a chemistry lab, you're probably thinking about data collection protocols. And of course, there's many other places where data gets collected very intentionally. But sometimes data is collected for one reason and then it's used for another reason. Or you're not even really aware that data is being collected, but it is. So thinking about like, when I go to the doctor, they take my blood pressure. And that's probably to make sure that I don't have hypertension. But if you were a researcher, maybe you could get access to all of that health data. It's pretty unlikely. There's a lot of rules about health data. But you could imagine how if you were the person who, uh, you know, had that electronic medical record, you could do something large scale with the data emails. So maybe you're sending an email, that's your purpose for generating the data, the text data of your email that's getting sent out. But uh, that could be used as data. So uh, this is maybe a little bit of a dated example, but there was the big Enron scandal. Uh, and as part of the lawsuit, they had to release millions of emails uh, that were sent internally. And that turned into this data set that's really rich uh, for analysis of how companies work. But the people who were writing the emails probably never thought that their email was going to become um, part of a data set to talk about institutional culture. And uh, my friend Felina Hermans does research about how Excel gets used in businesses, and she's used the data from that Enron probe. So people probably didn't imagine that. Uh, you know, a more common example, maybe you uh, are posting on social media and you're using a geotag to, you know, check in somewhere. That's mostly so your friends can see where you are and maybe visit the same cafe. But that location information could get used in lots of other ways. So again, maybe we'll do some brainstorming about this while we're all together. And in particular, one of the things that I want you to think about is the places that you left data exhaust uh, today or this week. So data exhaust is the data that just kind of flows off of you, whether you're aware of it or not. Um, it's maybe incidental to what you're trying to do. You don't know that you're actively participating in data collection, but it's still happening. And I think that there's a lot more data exhaust now in the kind of computerized age where we're using a lot of devices, uh, but it's kind of always been happening. So just take a couple minutes, try and jot down some ideas. And again, we'll talk about this when we're all together. Okay, so we've thought about data, we've thought about data types and where data maybe comes from. In this class, we're going to be talking about data communication, and we're going to talk about three main types of communication. So writing about data, that's using words to describe data, visualizing data, that's kind of using pictures, and then speaking about data, I guess that's kind of words, maybe sounds, I don't know, it's, it's a slightly different form of communication. So just as a couple grounding examples, um, here's a piece of scientific writing about how coffee increases state anxiety in males, but not in females. And I saw some TikTok that was saying uh, you shouldn't drink coffee before you've eaten food because it can uh, make you more anxious as a person. And I thought, I don't know if that's really true. So I went to Google Scholar and I looked up and I found this paper, uh, which says that maybe uh, coffee does increase anxiety, but maybe it's not the same uh, between uh, men and women. 
Um, so this is kind of a dry uh, way to communicate that information. The TikTok that I saw was definitely much more engaging. We're also going to think about data journalism in this course. So uh, this is a piece from one of my favorite sources of data journalism, which is ProPublica. They're a nonprofit that does a lot of journalism, but mostly data journalism. And this is just uh, an article that I picked arbitrarily about um, forests and logging communities. I think if you look at this uh, right off the bat, uh, you see a few numbers sticking out at you or numerals, a thousand residents, the 1990s, but I think that the data communication is being kind of buried in with the words. So thousands of trees, uh, twice its size, uh, services have dried up, um, as many as half of the families live on food deliveries. So even though we're not seeing numerals, there's data being embedded in this article. And there's also maps in the article. So this is also data visualization. And this is to show the amount of land that the companies owned at different times, and I think to display the amount of growth that they experienced. So that's maybe moving from writing about data to data visualization. And we're gonna see that data visualization kind of sneaks in everywhere. Uh, it's hard to write about data or speak about data without doing some type of visualization as well. Um, so there's also kind of goofy stuff. So this is from a, a website called The Pudding that does a lot of data-driven storytelling. I don't know if I would call it data journalism because it's it's not as uh, straightforward journalism. So this is just an illustrated guide to masked wrestlers and it has a bunch of information um, and, and maybe it's encoding some data in some way. When I think about speaking about data, probably the most famous person, and we'll watch this talk later in this cl class, is Hans Rosling. Uh, and he is, of course, he's got some data visualization there, but he is speaking about data in this very animated way. For the beginning of the course, we're going to try to focus on writing about data as much as possible. Um, and I've shown you a couple ways that you could write about data, and I think you've seen that in the readings as well. But let's think about some other types of writing about data that might exist out there. And, and maybe there's some broad categories, like data journalism I've given you as a category. But could we draw that down into smaller categories and draw more uh, distinctions? Again, I'd like to talk about that in synchronous class.